Next week in Pittsburgh, finance ministers from the 19 most powerful nations and the European Union meet for the G20 talks. On the agenda, climate change, financial regulation after the crisis, and of course, trade. Tonight, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute releases a report on the changing relationship between the two most powerful economies at the G20 talks, the US and China. A short time ago, I spoke with the report's author, Jeffrey Garrett, who is chief executive of the United States uh, Study Centre at Sydney University. Professor Jeffrey Garrett, welcome to Late Line Business. It's my pleasure to be here. All eyes will be on China and the US with the G20 talks next week. How has the financial crisis changed the hand of cards that each of these two players has? I think it's a very interesting story and probably an undertold one. Many people thought that the big global imbalances uh, China's buying all these treasury bills, the U.S. running a massive trade deficit with China, that would go away in the crisis because of declines in American demand. That actually hasn't happened. In fact, the imbalances in the U.S.-China relationship have increased in the past year. What I think has changed, though, is the political context. For most of the last decade, those imbalances actually have been the glue holding U.S.-China relations together. I think with the trade tensions of last week, we see the new world, and the new world is one in which there are going to be big economic frictions between the two most important economies in the world. How significant was the decision by Barack Obama to impose tariffs on imports of Chinese tyres? I think it was extraordinarily significant and there should be no surprise that the Chinese reaction was immediate and strong. The, the significance of Obama's action I think was twofold. First, uh, the, the tyre industry had asked President George W. Bush four or five times to do what Obama did. Bush always said no, Obama said yes. So Obama blinked? Obama blinked, but he blinked in an extraordinary way, which is he didn't say that China was playing unfair trade rules. He simply said that the Chinese tire exporters were so competitive in the U.S. that the, the, the dislocations in America merited unprecedented trade sanctions. I mean, that, I, I think this literally is without precedent in, in the U.S. and probably in international trade. This is a very tense situation with the G20 coming up next week. Has the referral of this issue to the WTO by China helped the situation? I think it probably has helped the situation, ironically, as that might seem, because the WTO uh, appellate process is a really long and drawn out one. So we would expect that if that this a decision on this case is probably years away, not weeks away. So in some sense, uh, the move to put it to the WTO was to put the issue on a temporary deep freeze so that the US and China can both go to the G20 and try to deal with the big proactive agenda that that grouping has on its plate. The latest figures from The Economist, and I quote, Chinese public debt per capita is currently about $650. In the US, per capita debt is $21,860, and it'll rise to over $32,000 per person by 2011. Now, the White House says it wants the G20 to agree on more balanced growth growing Chinese consumer demand and U.S. savings. Is this realistic? <laughs> realistic. I think the interesting thing about that is that it requires actually big domestic changes in China and the U.S. Mm -hmm. China needs to become more American. Chinese citizens need to consume more and save less. American citizens need to become more Chinese. They need to save more and consume less. Mm -hmm. So it's really a recoding of the economic DNA of both countries. It's about domestic change, but I think the temptation for both sides is to throw it out to the international community and to say that there's something someone else should do to rebalance the relationship. And that explains the frictions, I think, that we have seen and probably will see in the not-too-distant future again. So notwithstanding the financial crisis, we've still got this, we've got this new uh, animal called Chimerica, um, which, which is still a, a symbiotic relationship between the two. It's actually bigger, bigger and better or bigger and worse than it was before.
before, uh, amid the, all the talk in the last year of Chinese concerns about holding treasury bills and other and dollar denominated assets, China has actually increased its holding of T-bills by about $250 billion. On the other side, US wants to do away with its trade deficit with China, but today it's the case that literally half of the US's trade deficit with the whole world is with China. So yes, Chimerica is going to be here for quite a while, I think. With G20 next week, is there anything that's going to come out of that which will help the Doha round? I, I doubt Doha is going to really be on the agenda at the G20. I would expect most of the formalism of the G20 to be about financial regulation, new financial architecture, dealing with compensation and the like, executive compensation. Behind the scenes, I'm sure all the world leaders, including Kevin Rudd, would like a pre-consensus on climate change before the Copenhagen summit. Uh, I, I think Doha is just still in the too hard box. You talk about financial deregulation, but from an American point of view, that seems to have been displaced off the main agenda from, from the big health care reform package. How do you order the priorities from America's point of view? Well, that, I think that's a really fascinating question. I mean, the, the health care healthcare debate in the U.S. looks bizarre, arcane and everything else. People in the rest of the world can't understand it. I think what they do need to understand is that it will push back on Obama's agenda other tough stuff, things that are going to be real battles for him in Congress. So I think the order probably is health care until the end of this year, climate change in the first third or so of 2010, and financial regulation sort of off into the future, the middle of the year, when maybe the crisis is over and the sort of the, the imperatives for financial reform will be weaker than they yes, are so today. Yes, it might be put off to the never-never. It might be the never-never, and of course that might not be so bad from the U.S.'s standpoint because I don't think the U.S. was ever going to buy into the kind of tough financial regulations that certainly the continental European powers wanted to impose on the U.S. sort of as punishment for America's causing the crisis. Where does Australia sit uh, next to these two uh, big gorillas when it comes to negotiating next week? Well, I think Australia is actually in a really strong position, and it seems to me that Prime Minister Rudd and Treasurer Swan understand that. So the first piece of good news, of course, for Australia is that Australia's in the G20 when it might not have been in some other global groupings. Uh, there was a G14, for example, that was being mooted in Europe. So Australia's in. Australia's also a respected player. And I think that uh, if, if you're thinking about how might Australia participate in a US-China relationship, G20 today looks a much better bet than Kevin Rudd's first idea, the Asia-Pacific community, because there doesn't seem to be much enthusiasm either in Beijing or in Washington for Asia-Pacific community. Professor Jeffrey Garrett, thank you very much for talking to us. It was my pleasure. Thank you.